than 40% of Thailand's population was under the age of 15, and women had an average of six children. During the 1960s and the decades that followed, mortality rates declined, desire for smaller families increased, and investments in family planning enabled rapid declines in fertility. By the 1980s, women were having an average of two children each, and as a result, population growth slowed. By 2010, Thailand's population was larger, and the age structure was transformed with a smaller population of young people. This change in the age structure helped accelerate economic growth. Today, Thailand's population is dominated by working age adults who will be part of a productive labor force for many years. Let's turn now to Rwanda, a country that has made great progress over the last decade in improving health, lowering fertility, and increasing economic growth. Like much of Africa today, Rwanda's age structure is young, with 40% of the population under the age of 15, and an average of four to five children per woman. Even with Rwanda's progress, the age structure will stay young for several decades. In 2030, if fertility continues to decline to close to three children per woman, 35% of Rwanda's population will be under the age of 15, a higher percentage than in any country, including Thailand, that has realized a demographic dividend. In Rwanda, and in many African countries that have not made similar progress, getting from here to here requires three key investments. First, improve child survival. In many African countries, more than one in every 10 children dies before they turn five. Improving child health services allows more children to survive and leads to couples desiring smaller families. Second, space births and prevent unintended pregnancies. Currently, more than 50% of African women who don't want to become pregnant are not using a modern method of contraception. Increased investments in family planning will prevent unintended pregnancies, leading to fewer births per woman. Third, educate girls. Throughout Africa, only one out of three girls of secondary school age is enrolled in school. But when girls stay in school, particularly through secondary level, they are more likely to delay early marriage and childbearing and have healthier families. Together, these investments lead to lower fertility and mortality and enable the population structure to change, opening a window of opportunity for accelerated economic growth. We can see how declining fertility is related to economic growth in countries around the world on our Trendalyzer graph. On the left axis, we have the average number of births per woman which we call the fertility rate, going from zero up to about eight. On the bottom, we have the gross national income, or GNI per person, ranging from zero over to about 40,000 US dollars. This is standardized for what a dollar can buy today in each country. The color of each bubble indicates the region. Starting with the red, we have East Asia and the Pacific. Orange is Central Asia and Europe. Yellow is for North and South America. Green is the Middle East. Light blue is for South Asia, and the dark blue is for Africa. The size of each bubble represents the population size of that country, so bigger bubbles have bigger populations. The year is 1980, and through the middle, you can see a trend. As the average births per woman declines, the income per person rises. But we see that the dark blue African countries are clustered toward the back of this trend, with higher levels of fertility and lower levels of income. 
Let's look at a few of these countries. In 1980, fertility in these countries ranged between about five and eight children per woman. Income was between 200 and 2,000 US dollars per person. Although we are only focusing on a few countries, this represents the range of the majority of African countries in terms of fertility and income in 1980. Let's bring back the rest of the countries and see what has happened since 1980. You can see the trend over time, that countries are lowering fertility as they move down on the graph and at the same time, income per person is increasing as they move toward the right. When we come to 2010, the world is a very different place. We see that the African countries have made a lot of progress, though many are still clustered toward the back of this pack. But a few African countries have made strong progress in both lowering fertility and increasing income per capita. So let's go back and look at two of those. Botswana and Tunisia, to see what happened over time. In 1980, in Botswana, women had an average of six children each, and with the income per person was almost 1,600 US dollars. In Tunisia, fertility was slightly lower, just below six children per woman, and income was slightly higher, almost 1,900 US dollars per person. Let's see how things have changed. You see income increase right away in Botswana, and although there are some bumps along the way, fertility is falling very rapidly in both countries. Although Botswana's rich natural resources have enabled economic growth, it's Botswana's sound economic policies and social priorities that have led to gains for development, and the country is internationally recognized for good governance and low corruption. Tunisia was one of the first countries in Africa to adopt a policy to reduce fertility in order to accelerate social and economic development. Both Botswana and Tunisia have long prioritized education for both boys and girls and have steadily invested in access to healthcare. Comparing today with where these countries started in 1980, we see that families have two or three fewer children. Income has increased such that families in Tunisia have an average of five times the purchasing power, while in Botswana, families have nine times the purchasing power compared to 30 years ago. These dramatic changes at the family level represent significant growth and development for the entire country. Learning from the successes of countries like Tunisia and Botswana, we can see a pattern of investments which are necessary to harnessing the demographic dividend. Although lowering fertility and changing the population structure is the necessary first step, investments in health, education, economic policies, and good governance allow the changing age structure to be transformed into accelerated economic growth. A healthy population contributes directly to higher economic growth and poverty reduction. Improving child's health or children's health, such as through immunization and nutrition programs, sets the stage for healthy adulthood. Ensuring that children have adequate nutrition from pregnancy through age two can have a profound impact on their ability to grow, learn, participate in the workforce, and rise out of poverty. Yet, one in five children in Africa is moderately or severely underweight. As children become adolescents, ensuring continued access to health services, including reproductive health and family planning services, helps them to delay childbearing until they are ready. It will also help them avoid HIV and sexually transmitted diseases, enabling youth to stay in school and transition to healthy, productive adults. Promoting healthy lifestyles keeps adults productive and participating in the workforce and economic growth of the country. At the same time, 
investments in education are critical to seizing the opportunity of a healthy workforce. Investments in schooling and expansion of secondary education will ensure that a country has a skilled workforce for future economic growth. Right now, many countries struggle to provide quality primary schooling. But as population growth slows, many African countries will have more resources per child for education. Governments must seize this opportunity by expanding access to education. Educational systems must also be responsive to the labor needs of an expanding economy. These investments in education can have quick returns for individuals and families. Each year of schooling is associated with an increase in wages of up to 10% or more. And improving the education of young people today means a higher quality workforce in the future. With additional training and skills, young people will be equipped to compete in the global economy. Yet dramatic variation in secondary school enrollment across Africa suggests uneven opportunities for achieving a dividend. In West Africa, only 27% of secondary school age girls and 37% of boys are enrolled in school. But in Southern Africa, 92% of girls and 88% of boys are enrolled. Improving secondary school enrollment, especially for girls, will accelerate progress towards the dividend. But to fully realize the benefits of the investments in health and education, they must be accompanied by supportive economic policies that create jobs for today's large population of youth and harness the power of the age structure transformation. With fewer children and higher levels of education, more women can transition to paid and higher skilled jobs. Sound economic policies will increase meaningful employment by fostering growth in the skilled workforce. Governments must shift economic priorities into sectors that can absorb today's youth, such as manufacturing, service, and technology. Governments must ensure that women and men have equal opportunity and skills for the workforce. Sound economic policies also promote free trade and open markets, attract foreign and domestic investment, and help grow the private sector. And there must be attention to fostering personal savings and expanding access to economic opportunities for rural and poor communities through microfinance and targeted programs. Finally, good governance practices, including rule of law, stability and security, efficiency and accountability, along with strong and transparent institutions are essential to harnessing the demographic dividend. Indeed, good governance is a vital ingredient that turns the wheels of progress and engages the power of the demographic dividend. Each of these areas of investments contributes to transforming the possibility of a demographic dividend into the reality of accelerated economic growth. It starts with a change in the population age structure which hinges on lowering fertility through access to voluntary family planning, improved child health, and education. Investments in health services and education foster a healthy, productive, and skilled workforce. Economic policies foster job growth, trade, and foreign investment, while good governance builds civic participation and confidence in the government and social institutions. Each sector is important for economic development, but no sector alone can transfer the momentum of the age structure transformation into the economic growth of a dividend. All of the gears must work together. As each component fits into place, the gears begin to turn and engage pushing the nation forward to the promise of accelerated development and prosperity by harnessing a demographic dividend. Thank you.
um, accelerated action on the post-2015 um, MDG agenda. After that brilliant presentation from Sheila, ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you the story of uh, Sunita. She lives in a small, remote village of India. At a tender age of 17, Sunita was already a mother of two children, excluding the one who died within hours of birth. These three children she bore in rather quick succession. They were low birth weight babies and remained sickly and weak as they were growing up. This was a case of what I call a child bearing a child, but Sunita, who never attended school, was unaware of the grave risk to her own and her children's life and health posed by her delicate age, further exacerbated by lack of adequate spacing between births. However, at the time of the birth of a third child, Sunita availed of the free ambulance to reach the nearest public health institution and chose to get a postpartum IUCD with 10 years effectivity, which like all other services was provided to her absolutely free of cost. On discharge, as the free ambulance dropped her back home with her newborn on her lap, Sunita was aware that she was rather fortunate in having survived three quick childbirths. Armed with new information and first-hand experience of services, Sunita is now a strong advocate of family planning and health benefits it brings for mothers and children. With the community health worker that we call Asha in India, she spreads the message of prevention of child marriages and adequate spacing between births. Sunita's story is about both despair and hope. Despair that notwithstanding laws that prohibit child marriages, they continue to happen in many parts of the world. That 7.3 million children in poor countries become untimely mothers each year. Two million are actually girls below 14 years of age. But Sunita's story is also about the power of family planning to transform the lives of millions of young women. It is about the profound impact that family planning can create when it becomes a central part of inextricably integrated maternal and child health care that we are endeavoring to do in India. It is about the spin-off that health system strengthening and elimination of out-of-pocket payments can entail on which we are investing money in India. For India, family planning is a development imperative. We regard it as a key priority that unlocks the potential of young women as well as resources for sustainable development. Fresh estimates suggest that teenage pregnancies, if prevented in India, could earn 7.7 .7 billion US dollars for India's economy, which is 12% of our annual GDP. We are all aware, and as Elizabeth said, that MDG 5P that promises universal access to reproductive health was added rather late to the MDGs. And considering that the world is still quite far from achieving both MDGs 4 and MDG 5, this is most certainly unfinished business for us, which must be put at the heart of the post-2015 agenda and pursued with renewed vigor and commitment. Friends, London Summit on Family Planning was a watershed event as it rekindled hope for 220 million women, mostly young and poor, who are hidden in gender-biased environments around the globe, whom family planning services do not currently reach, and many of whom share Sunita's predicament 
of discrimination and deprivation. As FP 2020 initiative rolls out, India stands committed to a share of reaching at least 48 million of the 120 million women that are globally expected to be reached additionally with information, supplies, and services. And what are the steps that we have taken to realize this ambitious goal? First and foremost is the strong country ownership backed by mobilization of large-scale domestic resources. India has committed a domestic investment of at least two billion US dollars on family planning between 2012 to 2020. And these would be further amplified by augmented investments in health system strengthening to the tune of at least 30 billion US dollars during the same period under the National Rural Health Mission, which is the world's largest public health program. We believe that strong health systems provide the edifice on which family planning initiatives would stand and grow. Information cannot reach the young couples unless we invest in community health workers and counselors. Uninterrupted supplies cannot be ensured in the absence of investments in procurement systems and supply chain management. Services cannot be provided without investments in human resources, their capacity building, their retention, and in upgradation of facilities and health infrastructure. We also know that out-of-pocket expenses act as a formidable barrier for women and children. India is therefore rapidly moving away from the concept of fee for service and introducing free entitlements. We are providing family planning supplies and services absolutely free of cost through our extensive countrywide network of 200,000 public health facilities. We are immensely helped by the fact, of course, that we have indigenous capacities to produce a wide range of family planning commodities at highly affordable rates. We believe that the choice for family planning method must be exercised by the woman herself and not by the provider on her behalf. Women would choose differently depending on their individual circumstances and we must all be dispassionate but determined champions of choice by women themselves. At the London summit, I had stressed that family planning cannot and should not be pursued in isolation. Similar was our contention at the global call to action on child survival in Washington DC, where with Ethiopia, India was the co-convener. We have since then launched a highly integrated RMNCH plus A strategy, which has gathered considerable momentum. This approach underscores family planning as a key intervention to improve health outcomes for mothers and children and emphasizes the vital role that adolescents can play. The fact that many states in India that have achieved the replacement level of fertility have high MMR and high child mortality makes it abundantly clear that family planning cannot simply be viewed as a population stabilization strategy. There are several dimensions of fertility that impact the health of mothers and children, which must be addressed. And these include preventing child marriages and early childbearing, delaying the first birth, particularly in very young mothers, ensuring adequate spacing between births, and paying special attention to the contraception needs of high-risk groups, that is adolescents, where CPR is very low, but also women in the age group 35 to 49 years. A sharp focus on spacing is our new paradigm in India. We are now reaching women at their doorstep with contraceptives that are distributed by 900,000 community workers in every nook and corner of a large and diverse country. We are also training over 200,000 nurse midwives to provide spacing methods in the close vicinity of the community. To capitalize on the massive surge in institutional births, we are aggressively strengthening postpartum 
family planning services. More than 16 million women are now delivering in public health facilities in India every year. And this number is constantly rising as a result of a new program that has introduced free entitlements for pregnant women, which include to and fro, free transport, in addition to free drugs, diagnostics, and diet. This supplements the world's largest conditional cash transfer scheme that we run for pregnant women. Universal access to free pregnancy test, which is now an essential part of every community health workers kit in India, and strengthening of safe abortion services are very important elements of a strategy to bring down unintended births. We believe that the global discourse on family planning must focus on the importance of safe abortion much more emphatically, and that failure to provide comprehensive abortion care could weaken global efforts to empower women to exercise reproductive choices. The A in our new RMNCH plus A strategy denotes a new focus on adolescent health. This is to ensure that adolescents become an integral part of RMNCH continuum and that the vast potential of the 240 million strong population group, which is already more than 20% of India's population and is constantly growing, is harnessed. A new adolescent health program is on the anvil and our endeavor is to use this program as an entry point to shape mindset to develop healthy and positive attitudes, including respect for women and their empowerment among both adolescent boys and girls and support them to make positive choices in life. Friends, national progress in India masks substantial subnational disparities across states and within states. For instance, unmet need in India ranges from as low as 8.1 to a high of 35.9, recognizing that there is an urgent need to focus on the underserved and marginalized, we have carefully identified such geographies and subpopulations and prioritized them for intensified action, higher financial investments, flexible need-based approaches, and harmonized technical assistance by development partners. Equity and quality are now at the center of all our endeavors. The task before us is indeed daunting. Seamless and fruitful partnerships can make it easier. Government, development partners, academia, researchers, civil society, private sector, all need to come together to make it happen. We must all unite to do things, do them well, do them at scale, and do them with a sense of urgency. Friends, accountability for results is a moral imperative we feel. Each one of us must hold ourselves to account. We must walk the talk that we have been making here and open ourselves to scrutiny. One of our recent initiatives in India is to introduce quarterly scorecards, both at the national and sub-national levels, to track progress and enhance accountability. Alluding to mundane, concerns of human beings, Confucius once remarked that if a man loses his duck, he goes all over the village searching for it. What happens when a woman loses her right over her fertility, nay, loses her baby or her own life? How many are bothered? Ladies and gentlemen, let us all stand and work together to ensure that travails of Sunita's story become a thing of the past, that they are not repeated every day across the globe. Let us create an environment where girls are valued and nurtured, where they are educated and empowered, where they can exercise choices for themselves and their families. I thank you for your attention. In our development, and then what Indonesia thinking about post-development post-2015 development agenda. Uh, slide. I would like to uh, divide my presentation, one, about integration. Second, how the Indonesia progress in MDGs, just uh, a glitch of that. 
and their interlinkages among MDGs and SDGs, and how can we generate it the agreeable post-development agenda after 2015, and then what is the role of family planning in the post-development agenda, and concluding remark slide. Let me. Indonesia's commitment to achieving the MDGs is already in line with our national goal. And MDGs is embedded in our uh, two-time, five-year plan, national development planning. And then we are also including MDGs in the first 25-year long-term development planning. And we are ready to revise the long-term development planning according to the latest uh, post-2015 uh, development agenda and preparing the next step of the second long-term development planning. And we also realize that to achieve MDGs, we have to maintain the positive economic growth. And also the important thing, strengthening the democratic institution during the last 10 years. Inlining the goals of MDGs into our national development strategy, which are pro-growth, pro-poor, pro-jobs, and pro-environment. And also increasing allocation of public funding, not only at central level, but also at district and provincial level. And then uh, setting measurable targets for each level of government, so then we can give incentive or disincentive of the achievement. And then uh, having productive partnership between the government and all kind of civil society organization. We also realize that uh, that's not enough. We have to develop that centralized approach because to reduce disparity, you cannot do the one, uh, you know, one policy fits for all. And we have to do affirmative action and taking into account the size, growth, and distribution of the population. And we ensure the good governance and also a funding mechanisms providing incentive to better performance and keep increasing the achievement in uh, getting the MDGs into the grassroots and support for the expansion of the social services in disadvantages as well as backward islands and areas. And uh, we also realize that we have to improve the public-private partnership in achieving MDGs. And then we coordinating uh, the CSR from many companies in multinational, national, state-owned corporation. So then the CSR are geared toward achieving uh, MDGs goals. And then also enhanced cooperation with creditors. So we have the special debt swap policy from the creditor. As far as we use for MDGs, we cannot pay, uh, we don't have to pay the, the, the loan from the grantor. Uh, this is one of the uh, sample. We produce uh, seven times already annual report to international organization and Indonesian language to all line of the uh, societies. And we also realized that uh, because of that, some of the targets have been achieved. Some of the targets significant in pro quite progressive is significantly. However, we believe that that can be, uh, that can be achieved, but also we realize some of the target cannot be achieved. So for example, this is MDG's target that have been already achieved. One is MDG's goal one on poverty, reducing or halving the income per capita below $1 uh, from 2000 to 2008. We have achieved that. Second, the gender equality at primary school. We have equal and then now uh, leading to the secondary school, uh, but still need to, to do some, uh, some work and also an increase in detection of uh, tuberculosis. We are one of the, the contributor to the reduction of TB cases in the world. In addition to that, uh, we also realize, slide, slide. Uh, how, this is the most important aspect, what we call unfinished agenda, maternal mortality rate. Despite all kind of program, developed and implemented by Indonesian, we have to say that we fail in this aspect. Our maternal mortality rate is not 
decreasing but increasing from 2,228 in 2007, now is 359 in 2012, according to DHS. This is the most important unfinished agenda need to be covered in our two, uh, 2015 post-development agenda, and also HIV AIDS. Uh, how we combine the experience, country experience in MDG's achievement or development with the post-2015 development agenda. This is a schema that most of you know. Uh, we have a high-level panel of eminent person, our president, one of the three chairs, and then the high-level panel have given the report to Secretary General by March 2012, and now by September 2013, the report have been uh, reported by Secretary General to the General Assembly of United Nations. And now we are in the process of addressing all our input to the country engagement, to the journal uh, engagement, as well as to thematic uh, topic that need to be incorporated before the final say on the uh, 2015 development agenda being agreed at 2014 General Assembly. So how do Indonesia try to understand the progress? We have unfinished agenda and we, we have the further goals that need to be included because not, it's not sufficient in the, in the MDGs. And then what I think in the high level panel a report that are not covered sufficiently, especially from environment uh, point of view. And then we do expect all of us can contribute before the agreement on the post-2015 development agenda being agreed at the 2014 General Assembly. So by having this three, uh, this three layer, and now we are trying to measure our achievement or unfinished agenda in MDGs, what are our planning strategy in the country to address the possible post-2015 development agendas and then incorporating the Rio Plus 20 uh, uh, recommendation. This is what we are doing and MDGs already being incorporated in our uh, uh, medium term development planning for two times and then we have one long term development planning from 2005 to 2025, and we are ready to revise this based on the post-2015 development agenda. This is a comparison. We have eight tar goals and 20 21 targets in the MDGs. The high-level panel report suggested that to have 12 targets and 54 goals. Seems to me, in my opinion, at least we can focus on the how confident or how comfortable we are in seeing the tar goals number two, empower girls and women and achieve get gender equality. And then also on goal number four, number three, to provide quality education and lifelong learning. And then goals number four, ensure healthy lives. And then goals number five, ensure food security and good nutrition. Why I believe this is important, and this is very, uh, can be rallying point by us to enrich the process before 2014. In goal two, prevent and eliminate all form of violence against girls and women in line with our objective. Second, end child marriage. This is also in line. On goal number three, at least we can ensure that every child, regardless of circumstance, has access not to primary anymore, but to lower secondary and having different kind of vocational skills and life skill. And also, we realize that under goal number, uh, number four, ensure healthy life, this is a lot of work need to be done to detail this into achievable target, meaningful target, and also doable target. 
at least we have in the la, la, re, panel report ensure universal sexual and reproductive health and right, which is encompasses a lot of things. We can detail that into, a tar uh, into target and then decrease the maternal mortality ratio to no more than whatever country uh, 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 you know, uh, select. But at national, at international level, we have to agree on some percentage. And then reduce the burden of disease from HIV AIDS, this is also uh, very close to us, and preventable infant and under five death. Uh, I, because since I'm a nutritionist, I believe that including nutrition as one of the goal and also as a foundation for family planning. So the goal number five need also to be incorporated in our uh, 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 suggestion. So I think uh, Indonesia has incorporated MDGs into their national development plan uh, during the last 10 years at least, and we are ready to be to entertain whatever the 2015 post-development agenda being agreed at a General Assembly of United Nations. Thank you for your attention. Perhaps with the Africa perspective. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to be here to, to share with you uh, the advocacy work that we do uh, as PPD, Partners in Population Enrollment, Africa Region Office, and the work that we do, uh, supported by uh, a number of organizations and, and, and various donors. And uh, my presentation will, will be brief for uh, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, I have only a couple of slides. Um, but uh, basically the context is that uh, uh, the work that we do uh, in advocacy in, on the African uh, continent is focused in mainly on uh, four areas. Uh, the areas of, uh, of funding, uh, making sure that we do advocacy for increased funding uh, in the region at country level, but also to make sure that uh, the policy environment for reproductive health and family planning is improves and responds to the needs of the countries and of the regions. We also do uh, hold uh, leaders and uh, governments accountable on uh, the commitments they have made uh, on SRH. And uh, in this regard, I hope uh, uh, this. Uh, I hope this. Yeah, in the in the context, we, we hold uh, governments and leaders accountable. In the context for on the African continent, uh, on Maputo Plan of Action, as you all recall, Maputo Plan of Action is a very forward-looking, uh, futuristic, uh, comprehensive uh, RH uh, policy framework for the continent, and uh, and we know that performance on it uh, is uneven on the continent. So we continue uh, to accept that there is some some successes, but there are still challenges uh, along the line. We also. Uh, do advocacy on Abuja uh, to ensure that governments, as they agreed on, they devote at least 15% of their national budgets to the health sector. Uh, we, of course, continue to work on uh, the ICPD and MDG goals, and more recently, after the London Summit, uh, the FP 2020, to ensure that uh, 120, million <coughs> excuse me, 120 million women and girls uh, access family planning by the year 2020. And again, here we are not only working with the FP 2020 initiative, uh, but also with the countries, uh, as I will be uh, um, describing a little more later. Uh, in all this, we are now having to look at uh, uh, the context of the post-2015 uh, development agenda. And I think the purpose of this is to make sure that uh, all these frameworks build into the work that we are doing and that uh, we don't leave uh, anything behind. Uh, in terms of uh, the work that we do, we are privileged to have uh, networks and uh, strategic partners, uh, and among them uh, we partner with African Union uh, and uh, their regional economic communities. We work with the ministers of health and ministers of fi finance in the region. Uh, some of them, some of the countries have uh, just held a high level uh, ministerial meeting here uh, on Tuesday, and uh, I think a number of you were able to see what is going on. Uh, we also work with the reproductive health networks in the region, in East Africa, and 
and also in the West African region. Uh, we work with the parliamentarians, and uh, a number of the, um, parliamentarians are in the audience here. Uh, we also work with, the, there is a network of parliamentarians called uh, a network of uh, uh, parliamentarians who work on committees of health. Uh, again, this is a very strong network that has been able to uh, ensure that at the country level, uh, things are happening. And uh, you will be very pleased to hear that uh, after 2020, a number of countries are actually already moving on uh, the commitments of, of, of London. And, and I think the members of parliament have been also been very, very instrumental, considering that in a lot of the African parliaments, uh, indeed, these parliamentarians have uh, not only representative roles, uh, they, they, they are legislative, they do provide, they appro appropriate the budget, but also they hold the executive uh, to account and in their oversight uh, role. And so the, the working with parliamentarians is a very, very important um, uh, activity and, and for us at PPD, Africa Regional Office, we continue to work with them. Um, we also work with the champions and uh, in particular, I want to recognize the presence of one of our champions uh, Her Royal Highness, uh, the Queen Sylvia of Uganda. She's here, seated in the front there. And they add very strong voices. <laughs> they bring to our community, to our constituencies, voices that otherwise would be uh, difficult from other people, so we want to appreciate your Royal Highness work. But there are others also who are not necessarily here, but that we work with, so we want to appreciate uh, their role. But we also work with partners that uh, continue to uh, give us uh, the resources that we need, uh, but also the UN agencies, WHO, UNFPA, uh, and, uh, and others. Uh, but we also work with the civil society organizations in the countries, and the work that we do is really very much energized by the civil society organizations which bring in voices and expertise that would otherwise, uh, wouldn't otherwise have. And of course, we work with the media and the academia as well. No, is it, oh no, technology. Eh? No, maybe maybe that slide. Okay, I, I think there's a slide missing. Maybe. Um, I, I just I had one more slide before this. Uh, uh, I guess the, the, our support, uh, I think they should remain on. Uh, but I had another slide which was actually looking at the unfinished agenda. And uh, I think, uh, Elizabeth, as we look at the, the agenda that we are going to be looking at in the post-2015, the issues of holding countries to own these programs, I think uh, the debate has been going on. Uh, donors, it's good, we get support from them. But issues of scaling up of these programs in order to be able to make sure you cover the whole countries, countries must come up and own these programs, uh, of course supported by donors. But the role of country ownership is, a ve is very critical and, uh, and, and I had thought that my slide would have brought this up. The other issue, the other unfinished business which I think still remains is uh, issues of quality service, uh, issues of making sure that we have uh, human resources for health. There is a, an acute shortage of human resources for health in a, on the continent, and this is an issue that needs to be looked into. The question of making sure that we, we remove stockouts. We get rid of stockouts. Stockouts are there. The funding is coming, but we need to make sure that uh, our procurement, our distribution, uh, and make sure that uh, women get contraceptives when they need them most. And uh, we, we, if they don't have the product with them, then obviously we are not helping them. And uh, my, on that slide which I had, I also want to underscore the role of the demographic dividend, especially on the African continent. Some of us who have worked on the continent for some time, we realize that uh, I think there have been excellent efforts and I think we have made progress. But we still have leaders and uh, some other people on the continent who are not yet hooked on our messages. And I think the question of the demographic dividend is going to be a very good entry point uh, in order to bring, on, to bring on board those leaders that uh, uh, also want to make sure I know, for example, in Kenya, they have Vision 2030. Uh, I think there is uh, some other countries, Uganda has Vision uh, 2040. 
in all these visions of these countries, which are their blueprint for, for development, they want to make sure they move from the developed country status to middle income status. And we know that there is no country in history that has shifted, has transited from, mid, from developing to middle income without reducing fertility. So the question of uh, bringing fertility down uh, through the demographic dividend, I think, is a very important message. And as I, I wanted to say, we acknowledge the support we receive from our generous donors. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joseph. Um, and please stay there. The word that you had prepared for this session. So I have a call to action, family planning and the post-2015 development framework, achieving universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. We, civil society, call on governments, regional and international organizations, international financial institutions, and the civil society organizations to join us in ensuring that sexual and reproductive health and rights especially universal access to voluntary, high-quality family planning is included in the post-2015 framework that will follow the MDGs. The report of the United Nations Secretary General high-level panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda reaffirmed these historical global commitments to ensure health lives and universal sexual and reproductive health and rights, and to empower women and girls, and to achieve gender equality. The time to act is now. When women are given access to full range of modern contraception and voluntary family planning services, countries will benefit from the demographic dividend resulting in long-term economic growth. Family planning is cost-effective and sustainable investment. Voluntary family planning and access to modern contraception are essential elements of promoting gender equity and women's rights and in ensuring that women have choice and control over their own lives. We call on governments to, one, ensure that universal access to voluntary high quality family planning and sexual reproductive health services, including the widest possible contraceptive choice is included in the post-2015 framework. Two, ensure that the existing MDG targets on maternal mortality and access to reproductive health that have not been met are carried over into the new framework as key goals and targets. Three, commit to closing the gap in unmet need for family planning in full within the time frame of the new post 2015 framework. For those of you who have not yet signed on to this call, please link to the statement through the website which will be available, the website for this conference. We encourage individuals and organizations to endorse this statement. The statement will be presented to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Thank you. Thank you many of the organizations and people who have made a difference in our field. So let me just start by explaining what the Excel Awards is all about. The Excellence in Leadership for Family Planning Awards, or the Excel Awards, provide us with an opportunity to celebrate progress being made within our communities to increase access to and use of voluntary family planning information and services. This afternoon, we will publicly announce the first ever Excel Award, Award recipients and honor their achievements. Awards will be given at three levels, the individual, team, organizational, and country levels. Nominations for these awards were submitted by supporters of family planning from across the world, including program implementers, advocates, faith-based leaders, members of academia, staff of various foundations, international organizations, and political leaders. 
close to 100 unique eligible nominations were received, comprised across the three award categories. A special awards jury or committee comprised of diverse representatives from donors, UN agencies, foundations, international NGOs, and representatives from the South, then used the publicly posted selection criteria to identify the recipients. We are joined this afternoon by Excel Award recipients or their representatives, though we will provide only a brief overview of their contributions to the family planning field. We note that their achievements and approaches deserve to be highlighted and discussed within our community. Their activities hold valuable lessons for both within and beyond the borders of the respective countries or regions and represent progress that can be made when women and couples are provided with full access, full choice to plan their families. But before announcing the Excel Awards, however, the International Conference on Family Planning organizers wishes to issue a separate special recognition to a leader in the family planning field. Given its crucial involvement in the organization of the International Conference on Family Planning, just one example of its strong and consistent political commitment to family planning, the government of Ethiopia was not eligible for an Excel award at the country level. Yet, as a community, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge its groundbreaking efforts and achievements in expanding access to family planning services for its people. In just a six-year period, from 2005 to 2011, modern contraceptive prevalence in Ethiopia increased from 14% to more than 27%. This, this success and many others would not have been possible without the steady government commitment to its health extension program, one of the most successful examples of task shifting for family planning in the world, and again, many others. By allowing health extension workers to provide injectables, contraceptive implants, the government implements one of the most cost-effective approaches to reaching impoverished persons in rural and hard-to-reach areas. This program has served as a model for other countries to aspire to, and the lessons learned from its implementation are already helping women and girls across the globe. And so, the International Com Conference and Family Planning Core Group and the Johns Hopkins University, in behalf of the conference, confer this special recognition upon the government of the Federal Republic of Ethiopia for outstanding performance and service provision and sustained political commitment. <laughs> At all levels to expand access to and use of family planning through the health extension workers and beyond. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Minister Dr. Kesete Berhan Admasu, the Minister of Health of Ethiopia, to accept this recognition on behalf of the government of Ethiopia. Now we begin with the individual Excel Awards. Individuals in small services. The first Excel Awards to be announced today recognize such players for their commitment and success. The Special Awards Committee has selected two 
equally meritorious individuals as recipients at the individual and team level. The first such recipient suspense is Dr. Bokar Mamadou Daf of Senegal. Dr. Daff is the Director of the Reproductive Health and Child Survival Unit of the Senegalese Ministry of Health and Social Action. Through his role, he supported the Minister of Health in the development and launching of an ambitious national action plan for family planning, which aims to increase... That's it, that's it which aims to increase modern contraceptive prevalence among women in union from 12 to 27% in just three years. Dr. Duff is a fierce supporter of research and evidence-based decision-making. He has introduced performance management practices that enable the use of data and family planning service delivery and distribution, delivery and distribution to monitor and accelerate progress towards national goals. He has also been instrumental in the pilot testing and scaling up of informed push distribution model of contraceptives and works with colleagues in other fields to apply the same program. <laughs> Further, Dr. Duff does this work in a spirit of true collaboration, giving credit to his partners without hesitation. The success of this effort is also visible. Preliminary results of the continuous demographic and health survey presented this, this December in Senegal showed that the modern contraceptive prevalence among women in union has increased from 12 to 16 percent in just one year. <laughs> An Excel award at the individual level is therefore presented to Dr. Duff for his pioneering role in strategy development, strengthening the use of evidence, and expanding access to family planning in Senegal. Dr. Duff will be speaking in French. For those of you who would like to hear English translation, once you receive, you have one minute as a, for your acceptance speech, Dr. Duff. Bonjour. Monsieur le ministre de la Santé, de la République fédérale et démocratique d'Éthiopie, Mesdames, Messieurs, tout protocole respecté, c'est avec un très grand honneur que je reçois ce prix Texel. À cet instant précis, je voudrais d'abord exprimer toute ma reconnaissance aux autorités de mon pays pour avoir porté la confiance à ma modeste personne et aussi pour leur soutien sans faille. J'exprime toute ma gratitude à l'ensemble des acteurs qui travaillent au quotidien avec moi pour promouvoir la planification familiale et assurer les services de qualité, sont, que ces services de qualité sont offerts aux populations qui en demandent. Je dédie donc ce travail aux prestataires du secteur privé, public et à la société civile dans tout son, dans tout son ensemble. Je mesure à sa juste valeur l'appui technique et financier des partenaires bilatéraux, multilatéraux. Et je leur dis que l'environnement n'a jamais été aussi favorable que maintenant. Restons ensemble pour un meilleur devenir du monde. Saisissons cette opportunité pour mieux servir les femmes, les filles, les familles et les populations plus généralement qui attendent beaucoup de nous. Un grand merci aux organisateurs de ce prix Excel qui jettent un regard critique et objectif sur les efforts qui se mènent à l'échelle mondiale. Vous comprenez donc tout le plaisir que j'ai à recevoir ce prix. J'en suis fier, mais je reste humble au regard de tous les efforts qui restent à faire. Je le considère donc comme un appel à l'action pour faire plus et mieux 
Et je redis mon, mon engagement pour redoubler des efforts pour fournir un accès complet aux services de planification familiale et satisfaire à la demande de tous ceux qui en ont besoin au Sénégal. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Let's have the photo off for the recipient. Together, please. Thank you very much. I think um, sleep and tiredness is fast catching up with me because I just made a horrendous mistake. So I will uh, beg for your uh, forgiveness. I forgot to invite the Honorable Minister Cassetti, you know, for your one minute for accepting the special award for Ethiopia. Please, my friend, do you forgive me? <laughs> That's okay. Well, he, he knew that I don't have a prepared speech, so that's why he skipped it. But anyways, I would, uh, on behalf of the government of Ethiopia, I, I humbly accept the award and I thank uh, the organizers and John Subquins University for recognizing uh, what Ethiopia is doing. And this award is uh, a recognition of our amazing health extension workers who are doing a fantastic job. It's a recognition for all the health professionals working at all levels of the system. And it's, it's also a recognition to our model families and women volunteers who are advocating for improvement of uh, the health of you know, their fellow citizens. It's also a recognition for the right policies and the strategies that our government has put in place. We are just beginning and we won't end we won't rest until we improve the health of Ethiopians. Thank you very much. The ICFP is pleased to announce the next recipient of an award at the individual team level. Dr. Mengistu Asnaki of Ethiopia. Please. Stay there, stay there. Stay, stay there for now. Dr. Asnaki has played a key role in the development of national family planning strategies and guidelines and has been instrumental in the creation and promotion of community-based family planning distribution in rural Ethiopia since the early 1990s. He is currently the country representative of Pathfinder International Ethiopia, which also, while also serving as chief of party for the Integrated Family Health Program that covers 40% of Ethiopia with family planning and re reproductive health services. Dr. Asnaki is also the current vice president and president-elect of the World Federation of Public Health Association and is a former president of the Ethiopian Public Health Association. Prior to his long history with Pathfinder, Dr. Asnaki worked at various levels within the Minis Ethiopian Ministry of Health. He continues to advise and serve as a technical resource for the government of Ethiopia and partner organizations on all matters related to family planning and reproductive health. The 2013 International Conference on Family Planning is therefore pleased to present an Excel Award to Dr. Mengistu Aznaki for his role in strategy development and pioneering support for community-based distribution of family planning in Ethiopia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Aznaki to accept this honor.
Dr. Asunaki, your one minute acceptance speech, please. Excellency Dr. Kaseta Brahan Admasu, Minister for the Federal Minister of Health. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be among you this afternoon. I know I'm standing here alone to receive this prestigious award, which I accept with great pride and humility. <clears throat> but I want to accept it on behalf of thousands of health workers and women who are working tirelessly in the most remote communities and villages, providing family planning services many times in most difficult of all conditions and circumstances. They do most of the heavy lifting and many times done often, these are our unheralded heroes. They are the people who inspire me every day to do whatever I can. I'm so proud for what we have achieved in this beautiful country and elsewhere in providing access to family planning services. I'm also blessed and surrounded by people who take their work seriously and who work so hard to make a meaningful contribution to the people who need our assistance the most. I sincerely want to thank my staff at Pathfinder International Ethiopia, our headquarters, who trusted my leadership, the Ethiopian Minister of Health, where my heart and soul will always be for creating a conducive environment for the work we do, and all the donors who supported our activities in Ethiopia. I sincerely want to thank those who nominated me and the organizers who selected me for this prestigious award. Above all, my sincere gratitude to my families who are always with me when I'm working late and longer hours, but I've always been a source of encouragement knowing and believing that I'm doing this work with all of you in empowering people to choose the future they want. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. God bless Ethiopia, God bless Africa and the rest of the world. The next Excel Awards recognize the contribution of those at the organizational or facility, level, facility levels, players outside of government structures that are valued and necessary actors in expanding access to voluntary family planning. Similar to the previous category, the Special Awards Committee has selected two equally meritorious organizations as recipient at this level. We are pleased to announce that the first organization to be given an Excel Awards is, I wish I can sing, <laughs> Blue Ventures for its work in Madagascar. Yes. Stand up, please, yeah. and stay there. Yeah. Blue Ventures has achieved major breakthroughs in family planning demand generation service provision, and advocacy through integrated population health environment or PHA approach. This conservation NGO works with some of Madagascar's poorest and most isolated communities and has successfully leveraged strong community relations to integrate family planning into its existing sustainable livelihood and environmental management initiatives. The organization reaches broad audience through an integrated health and environmental education program and with its partners has also developed a sustainable community-based distribution model. The impact of this PHA approach has already been demonstrated in the Velandriaki area of Madagascar where contraceptive prevalence rate has increased more than five-fold since the program started from 10% in 2007 to 55% in 2013, and this having occurred in a region with negligible alternative service provision and against a national backdrop of declining CPR. 
farther. The work of Blue Ventures demonstrates how environmental agencies working in remote, highly biodiverse, underserved areas can address and meet family needs within a rights-based framework. The 2013 International Conference on Family Planning is therefore pleased, pleased to present an Excel Award to Blue Ventures. Please join me in welcoming Caroline Zavitsky, the Community Health Project Coordinator based in Madagascar, to accept this recognition in its behalf. You can speak in Malagasy, but we have, I'm not sure if we have interpreters here, but you can speak dual language. Yeah. <laughs> What an honor to be here. <laughs> Balbin, my colleague, friend, and a community health worker, I have the privilege of working with and learning from every day, recently told me, I see and I know the impact of our work. My community counts on me to provide access to family planning services that help our families and the environment we depend on. It's my extraordinary honor to accept this Excel Award on behalf of Balbin her fellow community health workers, and the entire Blue Ventures team, who work in some of the most isolated parts of Western Madagascar. We are so grateful for this recognition that integration of voluntary family planning services into community-based conservation, food security, and other environmental programs provides an effective way to reach some of the world's most remote and underserved communities with the reproductive health services they need. Working across sectors has empowered women, supported active engagement in natural resource management, and greatly improved access to family planning. In six years, the contraceptive prevalence rate in our service area has increased more than five-fold, from 10% in 2007 to 55% in 2013. The success of our work is thanks to the invaluable support of our many partners, and although there are too many to name in this short time, I would like to specifically thank the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Environment in Madagascar, Marie Stopes Madagascar, Population Services International, UNFPA Madagascar, and the MacArthur Foundation. If we, the international family planning community, are truly committed to ensuring full access and full choice, we must explore all options for delivering services. And this integrated approach provides a powerful way to ensure access for some of the world's most isolated communities. I wish so much that Balbin could be here with me right now to see this enormous endorsement of support for her work. And we thank the ICFP organizers, the awards committee, and everyone here for this incredible recognition. Thank you very much, everyone. The next and equally deserving recipient of an Excel Award at the organizational level, I hope I pronounced this well, is from Malawi. And the organization is Banjala Muzugulu. Banjala Muzugulu, or in short, BLM, has been crucial in transforming the availability of family planning in Malawi by championing innovative service delivery models. BLM is, a house, is now a household word in Malawi with 31 clinics, 54 social franchises, 39 outreach teams delivering services seven of Malawi's 28 districts. 
BLM's outreach team focused on providing family planning to the most hard to reach women in the country, adopting the model for each of the communities they serve. In many cases, this entails the provision of long-term family planning methods that are often unavailable in existing government or private clinics. Outreach teams also provide full, a full range of family planning methods at tented outreach sites where the teams build their own clean, safe environment in which to provide services. In 2012, BLM provided more than 130,000 long-term and permanent methods and more than 271,000 short-term methods. It has been estimated that almost half of the women using modern family planning method in Malawi receive it from BLM. With this extraordinary accomplishment in mind, please join me in welcoming Priska Masipuka, BLM's Director of Clinical Services, to accept this recognition in behalf of the of BLM. Distinguished participants, Honorable Minister, all protocols observed. I am humbly honored this afternoon to receive this prestigious award for Banjala Sogolo. On behalf of over 600 colleagues from Banjala Sogolo, and indeed on behalf of the people of Malawi, I am humbled to accept this Excellence Award Leadership in Family Planning Award. Banjalan Sogolo is a senior member of Maristops International. And it partners with UK Aid, USID, Norway, FICA, UNFPA, UNICEF, among others, to deliver family planning and healthcare excellence in Malawi. The majority of communities which Banjalan Sogolo serve over the past 27 years live in the in the rural areas. And these are the ultra poor, hard to reach, with poor access to transportation, telecommunication, water, electricity, education, and basic services. These are the people whom Banjara Sogolo works tirelessly. With unwavering support and leadership of the Malay government and the Minister of Health, Bandaran Sogol has become a recognized voice of family planning in Malawi, and indeed in the region. And this award will further inspire the hundred men and women of Bandaran Sogolo to remain committed to the people of Malawi in providing a broad range of health care and family planning services through our 31 centers, Blue Star Social Franchise Partners, and over 400 outreach sites. Bandalan Sogolo means family, family of the future. And along with Maristops International, we promote children by choice and not chance. On behalf of my colleagues across Malawi, and indeed on behalf of adolescent boys and girls, men and women of Malawi, I accept this award with great hope for a future where family planning is ever more affordable, accessible, accepted, 
I thank organizers of this award and all the people who chose BLM. God bless you all. Ziko Mukwambidi, thank you very much. Last but certainly not least, the conference wishes to recognize extraordinary achievements by a country government. The Excellence in Leadership for Family Planning Award at the country level is presented to the government of the Republic of Malawi for outstanding for outstanding results and expanding access to and volu to voluntary use of family planning services at all levels of the health system, public and private. Malawi has achieved significant success in the provision and use of family planning. According to the 2010 Demographic Health Survey, the use of modern contraceptives among married women of reproductive age increased from 28% in 2004 to 42% in 2010. This is a dramatic increase of roughly 50% in just a short period of six years. Malawi has also improved equity and access to family planning, especially for disadvantaged subgroups. During the same six-year period, there was a 60% increase in CPR among women in the lowest quantile, wealth quantile, a 60% increase among women with no education, an impressive 51% increase among rural women. Malawi's success in expanding the choice and use of family planning is a reflection of broad-based measures. It has put in place health policies for improving community access to contraception, including the National Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Policy of 2009. This policy provides a rights-based rights framework for the provision of comprehensive services that promotes informed choice and quality of care. Malawi has also shown commitment to expanding availability of modern family planning to the lowest levels, levels of the health system by training lower level health professionals to provide family planning services as well as referrals to the rural and hard rich areas. Further, on the demand side, Malawi has taken initiatives to reach out to people through mass media, folk media, community mobilization, and, other, and through local leaders. It is an honor to welcome two distinguished representatives to accept this award in behalf of the government of the Republic of Malawi. The Honorable Ralph Juma, the Minister of Economic Planning and Development, and the Secretary of Health, Dr. Charles Wanzambo. <laughs> 